Thank you very much for coming and welcome to our home. Um, we are in the middle of a discussion of, uh, actually it starts with the Parsha, Parsha by Yishlak, of listening to God. And uh, we began last week, and uh, again we'll do it this week, I think we'll finish off next week and then tie it all together. So I'd like to begin this week with a story. They tell a story about Remendel Futifus, a very special individual that I had the privilege to actually meet. Remendel spent 14 years in Soviet hard labor camp. One evening, all of his fellow prisoners were sitting around. Each one was lamenting about their situation. One man said, before he was arrested, he was a doctor. Things were great. And all of a sudden, he was arrested for dealing in the black market. Another was an official of the Communist Party. He had great and sweeping powers. And then out of the blue came orders on high and he was sentenced to, the hard, to a hard labor camp. Another was a professor. He had led a quiet academic life with his family until one of his pepper papers had been termed counter-revolutionary. <laughs> now look where they were. They were all devastated. The three of them then turned to Mendel. And they asked him, what about you, Mendel? Where were you before you were arrested? He told them, before I was arrested, I was a chassid. And now, I am a chassid. Being in prison doesn't change that. All of your lives are dependent upon external factors. When they are gone, you're crushed. My life has always been focused on the internal. And therefore, I am not crushed, even in these harsh settings. So Yosef did not let his surroundings dictate who he was. He was the same Yosef, whether he was in his father's house, a slave in the house of Potiphar, a prisoner in the royal dungeon, or the viceroy of Egypt. His surroundings definitely were different. They changed, but he did not. He did not follow the external factors to influence who he was. His internal being, his connection to God, the God of his father, was all that he needed to keep him strong, confident, and positive that everything would be for the best. In the meantime, he approached each day with a sense of hope and enthusiasm. As the Semak Sarek said, Trach good, so sein good. Think good, and it'll be good. Positive attitude. Others say that there are important lessons that we learn about parenting and marriage from the Yaakov, of our father. He was instrumental in widening the rift between Yosef and his brothers. The Torah states that it was known that Leah was hated, at least in comparison to Rachel. From Yaakov, we learn that one should never bring their children into their marriage. The relationship between a husband and his wife is private. It should be kept that way, always. Arguments or disagreements should never, never be heard or discussed with or in the company of one's children. That's not their job. It's ours. In addition, giving Yosef a kasonus possum, a coat of many colors, <laughs> was a recipe for disaster. There was already tension between the brothers. All that Yaakov did was make the difficult situation even worse. There may be many reasons why a parent may love one child over another. However, that information should be kept to themselves. Every child would like to think that they are their parent's favorite child. However, knowing that you're not can be devastating. Showing more attention, praise, or giving special gifts to one child can only sour the relationships between siblings. It can create jealousies that many times continue, even when they become adults, as we see with Yosef and his brothers. Yosef is sent by his father to check on his brothers who are out tending the sheep. When the brothers first see Yosef, they talk about killing him. Reuben was able to convince them to throw him in a pit. After Reuben leaves, Yehuda convinces the brothers that killing Yosef would be wrong. And he gives three reasons as to why. He has no money, which means so there's no financial benefit. He says we are going to hide his body, so no notoriety. 
and he's our flesh. And we are all brothers. So based on Yehuda's logic, they sell him to Egypt as a slave. <laughs> Not much of a salvation. Saved from death to live a life as a slave. Used and abused at his master's delight. In fact, it says that he was originally bought for immoral purposes. In fact, when the brothers come down to Egypt to buy grain, they tell the viceroy in Mikates 42.14 that they had come to find their lost brother, the Medrash states, that they were looking for him in the red light district of Egypt. So what we see is that we all have free will. There exists something we refer to as Hashkocha Pratis, individual divine providence. When Yosef, the viceroy of Egypt, reveals himself to his brother, he says to them, in Vayigash 45.5, God has sent me ahead of you to save lives. And then again in verse number 8, he says to them, so know that it was not you who sent me here, it was God. Of course they sold him. What Yosef was telling his brothers was that in the end, all that had happened to him, all that had happened to him was exactly what God had planned. Nothing's an accident. Though we have, may have the ability to choose our own path, our destination has already been decided by Hashkaka Praptis, divine providence. So let's examine the story. Yosef being sold as a slave to Egypt initially looks like an awful scenario. The Medjus tells us that Yaakov was destined to come down to Egypt in chains. But God orchestrated that he should come down with much honor and glory. He was able to spend the last 17 years of his life peacefully with his family intact and Yosef, his long-lost son, the viceroy of Egypt. 17. The numerical value of the Hebrew word tov, good. All's well. That ends well. We see the same scenario with Sarah that even though she had many difficulties, it said she died, everything was good, because the last years of her life were good with her son Yitzchok. But think how the story begins. Yaakov sent his 17-year-old son by himself <laughs> to the war-torn area of Shechem to check on the sheep and on brothers who hated him. Yaakov must have spent the next 22 years of his life wondering, was he brain dead? What was he thinking about? when he sent Yosef on this mission by himself. Again, Hashkoka Pratis, divine intervention. But why would Yosef and also Yaakov be forced to face all those years of pain and difficulties? The commentaries give reasons as to why they were forced to endure all their travails. But the main sin that they attribute to Yosef was speaking lush and heart, tail-bearing about his brothers. A sin that is considered to be the worst sin of all, even worse than the three cardinal sins that one must give up their life for. It is the root of many arguments, breakups, and misery. Marriages, friendships, partnerships, business relationships, even families are destroyed because of this sin. It lives as a cancer among us, especially today, with cell phones and the internet. It is deadly. Not only the person who speaks Lush and Harm, but also the person who listens to it. Both are called. So Yaakov also had to endure the pain of separation for 22 years. Which, not coincidentally, it was the exact amount of years that he spent in Loveland's house, away from his parents. All that goes around, comes around. He also understood that if he looked, he would always be able to see God's hand in all that he did. Whether he was a slave in the house of Potiphar, a prisoner in the royal dungeon, or the viceroy of Egypt, he was never alone. God was always by his side. This was evident right from the start of the narrative. Yes, he was sold as a slave, but the caravan that he was sold to usually transported sulfur, something that smells like rotten eggs. This time, however, they were transporting spices, again, to find providence, Ashkaka Protus. Our sages tell us that after the destruction of the Second Temple, when the Jewish nation went into exile, so too did the Shekhinah, the divinity of God. The same scenario took place when Yosef went down to Egypt. The Shekhinah, the divinity of God, accompanied him. 
It was not until Moshe took Yosef's coffin out with the Jews when they left Egypt that the Shekhinah was able to leave. It came with Yosef, and it left with Yosef. Looking at Yehuda's narrative, there's one reason missing for not killing Yosef, and maybe the most important and most obvious. Yosef was their father's favorite son. What would her father do if Yosef were dead? Yaakov was 108 years old at the time. He was no longer a young man. Rachel had already died. How would he be able to cope with his loss? It would seem, in a sense, that they didn't care, or even worse, that that was their intent. A strong statement. But why? What could have caused them to resent their father so deeply? Well, six of the brothers, the leaders, were the sons of Leah. The Torah states, Be'ene Leah Rakos. Leah's eyes were soft. It also states that Yaakov loved Rachel more than Leah. We see by the names that Leah gives her first three sons that she was trying to gain her husband's love. Her first, first son she names Reuven, meaning God has seen my trouble. Then she names her second son Shimon, meaning God has heard that I was unloved. And then her third son she names Levi, meaning now my husband will become attached to me. She hoped that since she could only carry two children at a time, that now Yaakov would have to accompany her. Rako Sinayim, soft eyes. What does that really mean? In a sense, she was a Yiddish mama, a Jewish mother, who loved her husband and children dearly. Her sons were eyewitnesses to the feelings of sadness that their loving mother was experiencing. It wasn't easy to watch, to hear their mother moan and cry about her loss. Even after Rachel dies, Yaakov moves his marital bed into the tent of Billah, his concubine, rather than into the tent of Leah, his first wife. An act that must have hurt Leah deeply. We see how Ruvain, her firstborn son, reacted to his mother's pain. He took his father's bed out of Billah's tent and moved it into his mother's tent. Again, it was considered a misdeed for him. However, 22 years later, we witness, witness a completely different narrative. In the beginning of the portion of Vayigash, it opens with Yehuda approaching the viceroy of Egypt to make a compassionate plea. He is trying to save his brother, Bin Yaman from being taken into slavery. He is asking the viceroy to show mercy. He has two defenses that he can choose from. One... He can base his request on the fact that Binyamin is 30 years old and the father of 10 children who would be lost on all levels without their father. Or he could ask for mercy for his 130-year-old father who will die if his youngest and favorite son does not return home. Uh, which do you think would be the strongest argument? I would think the loss of a father to his 10 young children would outweigh the death of an old man who is going to die anyways. However, that's not the case. Yehuda's impassioned plea to the viceroy was for the life of his elderly father. The same person, the same person he did not mention at all was the sale of Yosef. What changed? Well, they watched their father suffer for 22 years. Not easy. He was still Yaakov and he was still their father. Leah, their mother, had already died. And they were no longer boys. They were now grown men with families of their own and life experiences under their belts. You know, as we get older, we are not always so quick to judge others. In addition, time has a way of curing all ills. It's hard to keep the fire of anger burning forever. You know, I remember when my wife and I were in our early years of marriage. We had friends with children. And we really questioned about their parenting methods. We said to each other, we would never. <laughs> and we had our own children. And we were given a rude awakening. We were not in charge. <laughs> so what is it that we learned from Yaakov's encounter with Asaph's angel and the fact that he was injured in his sciatic nerve? The sciatic nerve, or what we call the Gid Hanasha, is an allusion to children and the difficulty we endure in trying to bring them up. Being a parent is not easy. Maybe because more than you bring up your children, you bring up yourself. Your children 
were handpicked for you by God Almighty. And for a reason. The numerical value of the words Git Hanash is 377. The same numerical value as the word Zeh Yosef HaTzadik. This is Joseph the Righteous One. Also, 377, 3 plus 7 plus 7 is 17. The numerical word, the numerical value of the word Tov, again, good. So what's the connection between Yosef and Esau? And the measure called Yosef, Esau's shadow. The Shemi Shmuel site in the Avni Nazar explains Yosef's special power over Esau. He was named Esau when he was born, which comes from the word Asu, fully made, since he looked much older. He was, so to speak, perfect. The name Yosef means to add. No matter how much he attained and no matter how high he reached spiritually, Yosef always felt incomplete. He knew that there was much more for him to attain in his spiritual growth. Yaakov knew that with the birth of Yosef, he could now return to the land of Israel, since the attribute of Yosef is diametrically opposed to Esau and was the only power that could overcome his evil. Yosef was referred to as fire and Esau to straw. But why would there be a connection between Yosef and the Gen of Nusha and good? Starting with the beginning of creation, sibling rivalry has been a serious issue resulting in violent intentions and even murder. Ephraim and Manasseh, the two sons of Yosef, are the first time in history that we read about two brothers where the younger is blessed over the older and there's no mention of any animosity among them. This is one of the reasons that why on Friday night we bless our children. We bless our sons. They should be Simcha Lokim Ephraim Manasseh. They should be like Ephraim and Manasseh. Yosef understood only too well the dire consequences that can result from sibling rivalry. He had lived it. He was a victim. He made sure that history would not repeat itself. He worked diligently on the relationship between his sons. Again, the concept of parenting. And this is why we were chosen to be God's special nation. In the portion of Bayera, 1819, it states that why God chose us. It states clearly, for I have known him, alluding to Abraham, Avraham Avinu, that he will command his children and his household after him, that they may keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice. It all goes back to parenting. God knew that we as Jews would always be family-oriented, passing on godly values to our children, our most precious possession. After all, our children are the guarantors of the Torah. We see that Yosef was able to bring up two sons, as righteous, God-fearing individuals, even though they lived in the most licentious, immoral, and ungodly country. One would have thought that with him being the second most powerful person in the world, that his sons would take some liberties. And yet, his sons were able to become two of the tribes of Israel. As Yaakov said to Yosef in the portion of Ayaki 48.5, Ephraim and Manasseh shall be mine like Reuben and Shimon. In fact, the numerical value of Ephraim and Manasseh, 752, is one greater than the numerical value of Reuven and Shivan, 751. So by listening to God, it is amazing how much real life advice and knowledge we can attain. You know, a smart person learns from their mistakes. A brilliant one learns from someone else's. Who says that we have to step into every pothole? And with that knowledge, let us pray to usher in the coming of Mashiach quickly and in our time. Thank you very much for listening. God willing, last week we'll bring it all together and great lessons that we learned by listening to God. Have a great week. Again, a happy new year to all of you. And uh, God should only bless you with safety and happiness and health. And again, Shabbat Shalom. Thank you again for listening.